asked me about that, and I don't think so from I don't think so from that particular experience. Though I will say, I believe I've been visited by several close relatives and friends who died visited me in my dreams, and I'm so sure that they visited me, and they were very calm, and it was a I almost think I was in heaven once visiting one of my relatives, and I've always believed that, that it's a very calm and a nice, and quiet place. And one of the dreams that I had, a little friend of ours who was killed in a motorcycle crash, my friend and I had the exact same dream at the exact same time, on the exact same night. And I've always believed that something happens to you after you die, that your spirit goes and learns up. Thank you. And um, to use Tizzy, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Tizzy. To use her um, case of, to make a point, uh, one of the things that you're, we're going to get to here very shortly is that um, the, the deeper the NDE, that is, the more features it has, the more after effects the person experiences. So not to minimize what you experience, because the, to have an experience of, that's very real and lucid of watching my physical body from a position about six feet up is, is um, notice, noteworthy in itself. But uh, in terms of uh, all the things that can happen in an NDE, that's what's considered a relatively shallow near-death experience. It is an NDE, but relatively shallow. And so I wouldn't expect there to be much of uh, much in the way of after effects. Um, but the more features there are, the more after effects the person experiences. So we uh, embark on what what does this all have to do with you? Um, so a little review, fundamental facts about NDEs. Uh, this here's a different definition. A usually lucid psychological experience associated with a close brush with death or extreme danger involving an alternate reality of the material and or transmaterial domains that's usually profoundly pleasurable but sometimes distressing, that the experiencer typically considers real, absolutely real, both at the time and afterwards, which is one of the things that distinguishes it from dreams. Uh, when I awakened from a dream, as real as the dream felt while it was happening, I then realized, oh, that was just a dream. After a near-death experience, NDE ears are quite adamant that what they experienced was absolutely real. And in fact, many say that it's hyper-real, that it was realer than this reality. And uh, that this reality doesn't feel as real to them now, and that they've experienced this realer reality. And um, that the experience is followed by certain characteristic after effects. So the incidence, as we've um, discussed, is uh, in research studies of people who survived a close brush with death or extreme danger, about 80% report nothing or nothing unusual. About 20% report an NDE, whether relatively shallow or, or deep. And um, that the contents involve the uh, perceptions of the material domain and the transmaterial domain. And that after effects, um, people feel transformed. They feel like they um, imagine um, going to sleep one night and waking up the next morning and feeling like a different person. And that's what people say in, the, in that in those moments of the NDE, they were transformed and they feel really different. Um, psychologically, uh, near-death experiencers are less materialistic, more concerned about other people, more compassionate and empathic uh, than they uh, were prior to the experience. And this is from research, both self-report and reports of uh, people who are close to them, family members, close friends, and that sort of thing. And um, paradoxically, they feel a sense of uh, greater self uh, worth. Uh, if one has been in the light, felt absolutely known and absolutely loved, it does something to their self-esteem. And at the same time, they feel humble, humble because they realize that reality is so much more than um, they have thought before. At least that's their, their uh, perception. Um, spiritually, people tend to become 
more spiritual, but not necessarily religious. Uh, some people who come remain as religious as they were. Some become a little more religious. But uh, the trend is for people to actually move away from organized religion because they find that religion is too constraining to um, uh, accommodate <coughs> what they experience in their NDE. That they become very spiritually focused, have an ongoing sense of connectedness to something beyond themselves and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, other spiritual after effects, by the way, include um, the paranormal uh, kinds of abilities. People uh, have um, out-of-body experiences, uh, foresee the future, um, have encounters with deceased loved ones, like Tizzy was saying, um, and that was not characteristic of them before the NDE. So it seems to open something in the paranormal uh, domain. Biologically, people having had NDEs uh, often require less sleep. They sometimes are uh, much more sensitive to chemicals in the environment, to medication, and they have to take a, a quarter of the medication they used to to get the same effect, so they become very sensitive. And also there's this interesting phenomenon of electromagnetic after effects that people who've had near death experiences, um, at the, it's a kind of a joke at the IONS conference. You can tell the NDEers because they're the ones who aren't wearing watches, because they can't. They find that they wear the watch, the battery dies within a couple of weeks. They replace the battery, it dies again. They replace, it dies again, and they finally just give up wearing the watch. They interfere with lights, lights blow out, uh, computers crash and all that. One of my doctoral students did her dissertation on electromagnetic after effects and she um, had three groups of people. One is people who had, um, uh, had survived a close brush with death with a near-death experience, survived a close brush with death without a near-death experience, and to their memory had never come close to death. And she asked them the frequency with which they experienced things like computers crashing, their cell phone uh, blanking out, uh, difficulty wearing watches, and some of the typical ways that electromagnetic after effects manifest. What she found was the people who had never come close to death, if you just follow my finger on it like this is a graph, they, this is the level at which they experienced those phenomena. People who had survived a close brush without an NDE were slightly higher, but not statistically significantly. The near-death experiencers were significantly higher than both of the other groups. So they definitely do report these phenomena more often, and that's an area that's being researched more now to try to objectively measure you know, what, what they're giving off that is messing up the electrical things around them. So, um, and then there are social after effects. You can imagine if you have become this different person with different values and a different perspective on life, um, you might have uh, difficulty if you got married and your uh, contract in marriage was to uh, pursue material wealth. It just doesn't fit for the end of year anymore. And another of my doctoral students did her research on um, the effects of a near-death experience on marriage. And essentially, um, in most cases, the NDE caused the people's values to diverge, and then and they ended up getting divorced. And in some, a few cases, the NDE actually caused their values to converge more closely, and those people reported that their marriages were better than ever since the NDE. So the whole thing is whether the, how the NDE affects them. And um, again, the greater the number and intensity of NDE contents, the greater the after effects. So um, near-death experiencers can be anyone. I like to say that NDEs are an equal opportunity transpersonal experience. So um, any, anyone can have one of these experiences that transcends the usual personal limits of space or time. And uh, so now the importance to healthcare professionals. The deeper the NDE is, the longer and more challenging the integration process for the NDE year. And an important factor in an NDE year's integration process is their experience of disclosure to other people. What happens when they tell about their NDE? 
Are they met with skepticism, disbelief, discounting, um, diagnosis that they're crazy, or demonizing that this experience is somehow <coughs> a devil or something like that? If that's the case, the NDE tends to clam up and not uh, discuss their experience, and that um, essentially fixates them in their process of integration. So that um, uh, the first disclosure is very important. Now, I'm in the process of a study right now with my uh, grad, my research assistant, uh, asking near-death experiencers about their experiences of disclosure. And one of the things we found is that they disclosed most uh, earliest to healthcare professionals. So, and that makes sense. As soon as the experience has occurred and the person is in a position to talk about it, if they are inclined to talk about it, who's going to be around? Nurses, physicians, maybe EMTs, uh, maybe a life-saving professional. And so there is evidence that uh, they will disclose to medical professionals. And that first disclosure is very um, influential for them. And um, yes, yeah, so there's that, that, that point. And so uh, in this study that I just mentioned, uh, it involves 90 near-death experiencers describing a total of 192 disclosure experiences. And we found that um, NDEers disclose significantly sooner to medical professionals than mental health or religious professionals. And we um, asked about all those kinds of experiences. And that um, NDEers describe nearly half of their experiences of disclosure as positive, emotionally pleasant, and helpful. But um, they describe nearly a third of them as negative, emotionally distressing, and harmful. So, um, and uh, this, this difference did not vary by healthcare provider type. So it's just as likely for a medical professional to respond in a way that the NDEer finds um, harmful as it is a religious professional or a mental health professional. And also, it didn't vary by recency of NDE. And this is kind of an interesting finding for us because we had sort of hoped that as information becomes more widely known in um, uh, lay literature, that it would somehow seep into professionals' awareness of NDEs and that their responses would be more helpful. But that is not the case. It's just as likely for someone who had an NDE in 2008 to describe a, dis a um, harmful ex disclosure experience as it is for somebody whose NDE occurred in 1960. So, um, so focused education is really needed to help health professionals respond in ways that are, that are really helpful. Um, and we also found that the deeper the NDE, the more negative, distressing, and harmful the, dis their disclosure experiences were. Now, I wonder if you can think about this for a, a minute and, and figure out why this is the case. The deeper an NDE, meaning the more features that there are, the more likely the person, the NDE, reported that they had a harmful experience disclosing their NDE to a health professional. Why would that be? Skepticism, I guess. Skepticism, which why, <coughs> why would skepticism be greater with a deeper near-death experience? What, what's in a deeper near-death experience that's not in a shallower near-death experience? Probably more things that can't explain. Exactly, more things come to play. The more the person talks, not only were they out of their body, but then they moved through this space. They found themselves in this beautiful environment, heard this music that's different than anything they've ever, and more beautiful than anything they've heard on earth, encountered their deceased grandmother, um, saw Jesus. You know, the more the person says, the more the health professional's gonna go, what? And have this, um, this, this kind of reaction. And that is exactly the kind of thing that NDEers find harmful. Most NDEers will say that their near-death experience was unparalleled, the most profound experience of their life. 
And to have a reaction that is skeptical, that is um, doubting, and is even worse, um, pathologizing or demonizing, is very, very distressing to the end of year. And so that, um, that's why they, if they have a bad experience, they're likely to clam up and not talk about it um, to other people, sometimes for a long, long time, until they like come to an IANS conference and know that they're in a safe place where their experience is going to be listened to openly and, um, and at the very least accepted as something real to the person that has had real after effects for them. So, um, a little bit more from that study. In the positive, emotionally pleasant, helpful disclosure experiences, here's what healthcare professionals did. They recognized the NDE as an NDE, or the like. So they said, when the person started talking about it, they said something like, oh, yes, people have a lot, you know, a lot of people have reported experiences like that. Or might actually say, what you're, what you're describing sounds like a near-death experience. It's something that is known to happen. So just recognizing it, um, acknowledging it as a known phenomenon is helpful. Yes? Is there any relationship between negative effects of disclosure and the religious beliefs, should we say, of the healthcare professional that they're disclosing? Yeah, it's a great question. Is there a relationship between a, a negative disclosure experience and the religious beliefs of the person, the, the healthcare professional? And we just don't know that. We didn't ask that. I mean, our research was asking the NDEers about their experiences, so in most cases they didn't know what the religion was of the provider. So that's something we definitely will be wanting to research at some point. Yeah. Um, another thing that characterized the helpful responses is that the NDE, the um, healthcare professional, considered the NDE either real or potentially real. So you don't have to believe that they're real, you just have to believe that they might be real and have that openness of attitude. Um, that is helpful. Um, did not pathologize the NDE or the NDE year. And we can say from research that without a doubt, there is no relationship between a near-death experience and psychopathology. Um, because NDEs are an equal opportunity transpersonal experience, people who are mentally healthy have them. The, you know, most people are mentally healthy and most NDEers are mentally healthy. Um, some people who are psycho have psychological disorders have them. But the NDE itself is unrelated to uh, mental health. So there's no basis whatsoever to ever consider an NDE or an NDE a sign of craziness. And um, I just had a, at the IONS conference, somebody was telling me that he was in a, a, a little car accident. He wasn't really hurt, but they took him to the hospital anyway. But in the, um, he, he was ironically on his way to an IONS conference. And he commented to the physician, oh, this is kind of funny. I'm on my way to a conference to study near-death experiences, and I um, have a little close brush with death. And the physician said, uh, can you tell me the date? So he's starting to you know, check the, um, the patient's uh, contact with reality. And there's, there's no basis to do that. Uh, even, and this person hadn't even had an NDE. All he said was he was going to an IONS conference. So it tells you the extent to which healthcare professionals are ignorant of this area. And um, have these- Janice, you've got five minutes. Yes, thank you. And these people did not demonize the experience. So, oh my gosh, we've got a lot to do. So, um, <clears throat> probably the most, uh, I've, I've developed a little acronym thing for uh, what to do, how to respond most helpfully to uh, disclosure of an NDE, or actually, I think this is mistitled. It's how to react most helpfully when someone has survived a close brush with death. And the first one is not to disregard the possibility that an NDE occurred. Instead, narrate to the NDE or what you're doing. Consider the possibility that they might be, like while you're giving CPR, 
they might be um, out of their body watching. And so it would be very helpful, for example, to say, oh, this is if you're uh, during the search while you're on your way to rescue someone. And you don't have to say this out loud because NDE ears read people's thoughts when they're in this out-of-body state. So you can just mentally be saying to the person, I'm on my way. I'm on my way to, to um, reach you. During CPR, um, actually, you can actually say out loud while you're doing the compressions, if you can see or hear me, I'm doing what I can to help you, help bring you back. Now, interestingly, they may not be interested in, um, in coming back, but nevertheless, this is what you're doing, and it's good to tell, to convey that to them. Um, and so the NDE -er will feel elucidated as to your actions and your intentions in relationship to him or her. Um, also, don't discourage the NDE -er from talking about the experience. Instead, invite the NDE -er to talk about it. Saying something. Now, this as soon this I would say as soon as the NDE -er is uh, stabilized and calm and able to focus, um, to say something to them, and, you know relatively soon. When someone has been through an experience like you have, they sometimes have unexpected memories associated with the experience. Sometimes not. But if you did, and you want to talk about it, I'm here to listen. So all it does is open the door. And I want to emphasize this word, unexpected. Because you might think to say something like unusual memory, but already that kind of stigmatizes the experience. And so, um, or you certainly wouldn't want to say a word like weird or, you know, that sort of thing. So a word like unexpected is pretty neutral. And if you walk, if you remember anything from this um, whole morning, I hope it would be that one word to be able to say to someone, sometimes when people have been through what you have, they have unexpected memories. And if Usually they don't, but sometimes they do. And if you did, and you want to talk about it, I'm here to listen. And so the other, um, I'm going to uh, skip um, know and name the experience. You say, um, this sounds like a near-death experience. Um, and it's something that, um, you know, might be real. Uh, we don't know, but it could be. Um, and uh, it's not, you're not crazy, you know, to have had this experience. Um, there's nothing inherently evil about the experience. And, um, and if you are interested in some uh, more information, which ND years almost always are, and again, the deeper the experience, the more they become, so a lot of ND years become kind of obsessed with learning about um, spiritual things. Like you heard Mary Neal, the physician, she said before her kayaking accident, she didn't have time for spirituality. And then after it, she became very engrossed in reading related to spirituality. So, and that's very typical. So just to um, affirm that there's nothing inherently like um, crazy or evil uh, about the experiences, this is a, just a little summary of those that don't do the D's things, disregarding, discouraging, denying, and so forth. Do the N things so that empty ear feels the E things, elucidated, encouraged, educated, and equipped to get more information if they want. So um, empty ears would rather be dead than deed. You know, D's are the dis discouraged and disbelieved and all those things. Um, ND ears needs begin with the N's and the E's, and the E. And uh, if someone asks me, I want to read about ND E's, what should I, but I don't want to read, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there, what should I read? I say two things. Uh, bringing Valerino's Lessons from the Light, which I consider to be the heart of ND E's. And um, the book, Handbook of Near Death Experiences 30 Years of Investigation, that I flashed earlier, that's the head of NDEs. And um, then Stavis, uh, and uh, this is my chapter in Stavis's book, 
uh, and the Handbook on Safety and Life Saving. And then this is the article that we co-authored. And online, the um, IANS website and the um, Enderf website are the two that I um, recommend. Oh, I didn't put Enderf on here. But this last one is an online continuing education interactive program for healthcare providers. So, uh, and again, if you're interested in this PowerPoint, these resources, just let us know. So that is it. <coughs> Stanis doesn't need to add anything. Um, I think we have to finish. And so if you have questions, I'm going to be here. Uh, I leave after breakfast tomorrow. And so just uh, snag me anytime the rest of the day today or tomorrow morning. Stanis will be here the duration. Right? Yeah.